can I, do I want a second cam? No, I think I'm good with this. Hello and welcome back to my studio. Today we are talking about painting life models or painting from life or painting the human form from life, however you want to talk about that. But over the years, it's something I have done and participated in um, on and off. And every time I post my studies from these live painting sessions, I have people ask questions from how do I sign up for these? What's the purpose? Why do you do these? And they're all really good questions with not super straightforward answers. And in fact, when I went and kind of Googled and thought I could find like one really good blog about it, I couldn't. So I thought I would make a video, talk to you guys about what is life painting? What's the purpose? What is it good for? How do you find it all in one space? So if that sounds interesting to you, if you want to have some of those <laughs> questions answered, then stay tuned for this video. Let's start with the basics. What is life painting? What is painting a life model? So it's often referred to by multiple titles. Painting from life is just painting something you see directly in front of you. It's not painting from a screen or a reference photo or your imagination, typically. It's painting something right in front of you. And it is a cornerstone of sort of Western realist art. Um, that is to say that if you go to a classical atelier or a more classical art school program, you are gonna be spending some time painting from life. Uh, typically, sort of colloquially, when we say like a life painting group or a life model painting group, it refers to painting the human form from life. Again, specifically the human form is something that's very closely tied to sort of the core of what the Western painting and drawing tradition is. And so it's held in very high regard. I know on surface level, if you stumbled across this video, seeing a bunch of random strangers in a room together painting someone who's naked or nearly naked can seem really weird. But within the context of the fine art world and the tradition of Western drawing and painting, totally normal. And I will say personally, it does teach you a lot about using that hand-eye coordination. So there's a ton of reasons, including that one, why someone may want to paint from life. But the point is enough people have enough interest in it that in most cities and um, in most thriving art communities, there's going to be life painting groups. And what's really great about it is all the technical stuff that I'll dive into, but it's also a wonderful way to sort of gain community. The next thing I want to talk about is, of course, the benefits and why you might want to paint from life and more specifically, who might benefit from this practice. So anyone who has access to a life painting group, I think in a lot of ways could benefit from not only the communal experience of going and painting and meeting other artists and sort of building a network, talking to other people. I mean, the act of painting, at least for me, has been a very um, solitary one. I am in my studio by myself. I talk to a camera sometimes. Um, but all in all, I, you don't get a ton of like coworker or water cooler talk, so to speak. And so having once a week or so, or, you know, you can go less, um, you know, a group of people you can link up with who are also artists and can talk shop with you um, is really nice. Even if you're kind of introverted, sometimes it can be really nice to have that change. But let's get into the more technical aspects of what can be really helpful about painting from life. So like I said, you know, whenever you're learning to paint from life, you're using your eye and your hand and your coordination and all of those sort of more technical skills. The important thing that you're doing is you're strengthening that hand-eye coordination and the ability to paint what you see and to really shape your perception. Any good drawing practice would have that in it, but I've specifically noted that painting from life can be really helpful for with this. In fact, I remember when I was in college, I took a bunch of drawing classes. Side note, my school was a really big architecture program. And so all of my drawing classes were very um, architectural. It was very straight lines, literally. And um, it wasn't until I was a junior when I took a life painting class, a life drawing class actually, that I remember the act of just sitting every day and drawing what I see was the quickest I gained any real technical skill in art, um, hands down. <laughs> so I remember starting the semester kind of, you know, looking a little sketchy and not feeling super confident. And by the end of it, I really felt like my hand-eye coordination dramatically improved and it's something that I've carried with me to this day. And anytime I start to feel a little bit like I need to tune up my drawing skills, I will go look for a life drawing class. And that's in fact what usually brings me there. Another more obvious reason you might want to do life drawing classes or painting a model from life is of course practicing painting people. Now I'm a big believer that if you can paint one thing, you can paint another thing and you can paint another thing. I don't think you know, I sometimes stay clear of saying, well, like I'm only a landscape painter or someone's only a portrait painter. I feel like if you understand how to perceive the world and you sort of have your own style and way of like interpreting the world, 
then you can interpret anything. But that being said, of course, painting is a lot of building up familiarity and same with drawing. And the more you're familiar with the subject, something like a portrait, the better you're going to get at it. <laughs> it feels really obvious to say, but it's absolutely true. And so if you've ever wanted to get better at painting portraits, and maybe even you have a goal of like doing portraits for income and you want to practice, well, this is an excellent way to do that. Another thing I'll say on this last point is, you know, hiring your own models or finding your own good source materials that you can paint and you that are royalty free and aren't the same like five stock images that everyone paints can be kind of hard. And so the ability to go and pay that model fee and usually you get rights to whatever you're painting in class is a great way to practice and um, get that exposure and have that portrait painting skills in a place where it's, it's actually pretty convenient, all things considered. The next thing I'm gonna talk about are some of the cons or maybe the drawbacks or things to consider about life model painting or painting a model from life um, in this kind of group setting. And the first one is obviously the group setting of it all. For a lot of people, the prospect of getting to be around other people is gonna be really exciting. And that's the end of how much they're gonna think about it. They're just like, great, more people, wonderful. But I also know that some people are gonna feel really intimidated, especially if you're going to improve your skills. Maybe you're in a position where you're not super proud of where you are yet. I think you should be proud of yourself wherever you're at because if you're making an effort, then you should be proud of that. But I also understand that that's not something that you can resolve overnight. So I totally get it. I will say there are ways to sort of go into the studio and maybe pick um, a space that's kind of on the periphery um, and just sort of have earbuds in and you can kind of through body language show people that you're not wanting to showcase art. I will say the way it typically goes in my experience is some people love to kind of walk around the room and look at everyone's art and some people are going to be more willing to strike up a conversation uh, and typically those people are pretty good at reading body language you know if you're kind of in the corner if you've got headphones in then i think that's a pretty good sign that like you're not here to socialize some people are friendly i find that the fast fast majority of people are pretty chill they just want to ask you what materials you're using and are, are kind for the most part again this really isn't a class setting there's not like grades involved. And I feel like that dynamic makes it to where people are pretty chill. I ev Obviously, everyone's different and different people can cultivate different cultures. But generally speaking, it's again, it's not a classroom. No one's going to rank. There's not usually a full critique at the end. Um, and people are pretty chill. That being said, if you're really curious, you could probably reach out to whoever's directing the class and ask them what the culture is like. It might be a bit of a weird phone call, but if you'd rather have an awkward phone call than an awkward experience, then, you know, pick your poison, I suppose. But that being said, generally people are chill. It's usually a really cool mix of like older adults and some younger people. And I have found them to be nothing but amazing. And I'm not the most outgoing person ever. Um, so that's just something to consider. Another sort of con, I guess you could say, or at least just something to be aware of is that there usually is a cost. I've never seen one that's free, but maybe they exist. Um, but for the most part, it's a cost sharing. So hiring a model to come sit for you privately in your own home studio can be expensive. Obviously, it is an option. Um, but the idea of going to these groups is not only the social component, but also that you are splitting the cost of hiring a model. I've hired models in my studio. I usually pay gas and 20 bucks an hour. And, you know, over a few hours, it adds up. It's not cheap. Um, and typically, whenever I go to these classes, it's anywhere between 10 and about $20 for the whole experience. And the class can be as short as about two hours, but usually the ones I go to are between three and four hours for the entire, um, I keep calling it a class, but you know what I mean, group situation where you're, you're painting a live model. So that's kind of what to keep in mind, uh, which brings me to another point, not a con. I think for the most part, those are the two cons. It's the awkwardness and then you have to pay for it. The other thing to be aware of is how do you find these groups? So this is probably my most frequently asked question. Um, and it really depends. I, it, I wish this was easier because, um, I know if I have Googled life painting group near me, you don't get a lot of answers. Artists are kind of notoriously, you know, a little slow to sort of ingratiate themselves into like marketing and advertising. It's like the, the problem with most artists is like, you just want to art. You don't want to like advertise everything. So the ones that I have been a part of, you kind of have to snoop for it. And I find that the easiest way to find it is 
through social media or word of mouth. So you can Google and if maybe your city has a really well promoted, well integrated life drawing group, then you can find it that way. But if you do that and you can't find anything, don't assume that you don't have one near you. My next suggestion would be to find your city on social media and start hashtagging like life drawing groups or, um, you know, Milwaukee life drawing group or Edmonton life drawing, you just wherever city and see if you can find that that way. Or, you know, another thing you can do is if there is a um, portrait painter in your area who's an artist and it's accessible to you to reach out to them DM or comment and say, hey, what groups um, are you going to? Surprisingly, I've had this happen a couple of times. So, you know, and I've answered. So, you know, you never know um, who is going to stay plugged in and have those answers for you. Sometimes they'll know, sometimes they won't. It's worth shooting your shot. And then of course, if you know an artist in your area, um, you know, personally, you can ask, you might be able to find like ask gallery owners, you know, if you have a little downtown, maybe just ask around. And that's how I found the one in the little town that I'm from, because there's no trace of it online. I think they recently started a Facebook group. Um, but otherwise it was word of mouth and cash only. And it's just, you know, they can be hard to find, but don't give up, keep asking, keep throwing it out there. My next point is a very brief point, but it's how do you handle the nudity and like what level of nudity should you expect? Um, this can vary, I would assume city to city, region to region, culture to culture. Um, here I'm, I've lived in kind of the middle corridor of the United States. Uh, so, you know, re religious, but typically art communities tend to be a little more open. I have experienced full nudity, um, anywhere from my college experience all the way through the multiple ones I've done here in Texas. Um, and so, you know, I, I will say it's not as awkward. There's a little bit of sticker shock, but very quickly the model goes from being a person to like shoulders and light and highlights and texture. And I know that seems like really strange, but I promise it does. Like before you know it, you're just drawing someone. Um, you know, there are places I'm sure that do just like basic, like a tank top and underwear. But the idea is that, you know, your subject matter is the human body and all of its folds and shapes and stretch marks and everything that makes a body a body. And I find that just like in sort of being okay with that process, if you can, if it's comfortable to you, obviously, um, the quicker you can kind of get through that, the quicker it becomes really fun in a way. So yeah, expect that. Um, usually it's chill. The models have the robe sometimes next to them in between sessions, they'll stop and cover up. Um, and that's it again, it really is, it's weird to say it now to uh, my, um, my, uh, camera, but it's, it's really a not issue. <laughs> All right. So the last couple of things I want to talk about are supplies and then mindset. So supplies, what do you need? This really depends on your group. So uh, the first life drawing group that I was a part of here when I was in Austin was a life um, painting group. And so, um, I think you could go in and sketch. I don't remember anyone doing it, but that that's probably a me memory issue. <laughs> um, but it was, there were easel set up and everyone had paint. So, um, some oil painters, some acrylic painters, and that was kind of how that happened. Usually they will supply easels and chairs and tables. If, if it's, if that's a deal breaker for you, it's worth it to ask or call ahead. Um, but then you bring everything else. Um, so your paper towels, your canvas, your paints, your palette, your brushes, et cetera. Don't expect the studio to have it. Because again, most of the time you're just paying for the model fee uh, or maybe a little bit of a fee to, to use the space, but you're certainly not paying for materials. So just be aware of that. Um, whether it's drawing or painting, again, you can ask ahead. The group that I'm part of here in my little Texas town um, advertises itself actually as a live sketch group, not drawing. But I asked ahead of time, can I bring my paints? I told them that I'm painting solvent free. They said that was fine. If you're bringing paints to a sketch group, that would be harder, I would think, to maybe make work out. Um, sometimes they don't have the ventilation to hold up um, using like a solvent. So it's important to ask. Um, and they also may be using a space that can't get messy the way paints get messy. Even if you're a clean painter, it can be messy. Um, and then the other thing to be aware of, whether it's a sketch group or a painting group, is the time of the model poses. So um, because my group is sketching, <laughs> uh, the first few poses are three minutes. 
and I am just doing the quickest little palette knife. I just call it basically a warm up. Um, but once we get into the 10 minute poses, I can usually whip out a whole painting. Personally, this is my favorite and preferred setup. I will start out with um, my oils. I do have a solvent-free painting method. I am going to make another video about that, so stay tuned for that. But I use EcoSolve, which doesn't have toxic fumes, as my solvent. And then I have a handful of brushes that I use, as well as a small palette of paints. Um, I wouldn't quite call it a limited palette, but usually I don't bring more than like eight or nine paints. That's including white. Um, and then as far as what surfaces I paint on, this is always a little tough because whenever you go into these classes, and I'll talk about this in mindset in a little bit, um, you know, I don't bring my really expensive, nice gesso boards or um, my nice uh, canvases because I'm making studies. So I find that the easiest thing to do is just prime and gesso a lot of papers. You can use something like an oils arches paper, which sort of already comes set up to sort of take um, the heavy medium that is oil painting. Um, you can also gesso just like thicker pieces of watercolor paper. That's what I do. I'm, I don't think that that's like archival. That's just, I think I'm using it wrong. So don't, if you're interested in something being archival, maybe don't do that. But I also have known people to just gesso cardboard. Cardboard has acid in it. Again, it's not archival, but if your goal is to just go and practice and you're sort of indifferent to whether or not you're going to sell these studies you have a lot of options as far as surfaces if you do want them to be archival then i would suggest getting um, paper that is acid free that is meant to hold up acrylic or oil or whatever you're using i also bring my own palette and easel i have a plein air um, new wave yugo palette i will link all of this in the show notes by the way and that one works great for me it's a glass palette and i just have used it for years so i really like it and then I obviously bring some paper towels and a place to put the dirty paper towels. I try not to make a mess. And that's kind of it. It's pretty simple. Uh, as far as what I do with the wet paintings, well, I drive there most of the time. And so I'll just put my wet paintings in the back of the car. If I walk, I'll have my husband come drive and meet me. <laughs> so I don't have a good strategy for like having a bunch of wet paintings um, other than just sort of it's cumbersome. It's part of it, I guess. Finally, that brings me into mindset. I feel like it would not be a scary video if I didn't give you a little bit of like how to sort of mentally think about and go into these classes. Obviously, if you've already got your mindset and figured out like you don't need to listen to this part, but I do think it's important to know that whenever you go into kind of a group setting and you're, you can't unilaterally control the poses and maybe you get there a little late and you don't have the best seat or your lighting's not great, there's just a lot more things that are variables when you're in a group setting. Um, and so I always go into these classes with a very like open mindset that I'm there to play. In fact, you know, I've even said in my life painting groups that like during the week, it's so important for me to do such a good job with all of my artwork because I make artwork and I make, you know, that artwork is often my content and I, I have to make artwork very quickly to sort of sustain what I do as a business model. And it's really liberating to get to go to these classes and just sort of like not worry about if my paintings are good. Don't expect to have some kind of a masterpiece go for the experience. And the other thing is remember that like you can't control a lot of things because you know, you're in a group setting. But remember when you're in there, like if you feel like you don't have the best seat in the room and it's really kind of bumming you out a little bit, you can always like crop way in, just do a, a part of their head or their shoulder or, you know, really find a way to make the best of the situation. And I find that as an artist, uh, that sort of resilience or maybe flexibility, however you want to call it, but that ability to sort of roll with the punches, so to speak, is so valuable to have. So even if you're going and you're doing these live paintings and nothing you make is good, but you become a little better at sort of making the most um, out of your situation, remember that that's its own skill too. And remember to have fun. These are often very fun environments. You know, you get to be with other artists. And if you're anything like me, you feel like you're a mom 90% of the time. So getting to go and be with people and do art stuff can just be really nice and refreshing. A lot of these people will become your friends or your network. And it's really wonderful to have that in this day and age, especially in person. So just value that, have fun. And hopefully now you feel a little more informed about life painting and what everything entails. <laughs> That's my goal anyways. Let me know if you've done life painting groups or even life painting classes, what you think of them. And if I missed any really good tips that you wish you would have known when you went to your first life drawing group. 
Remember, as always, to subscribe, hit the bell notification if this video is helpful to you. I am planning on making a lot more helpful tips, artist videos, painting tutorials, all kinds of things. So if you have any suggestions to that, leave it below. Thank you for watching. Happy creating and take care.